In the early 20th century, William Allen White was an iconic newspaper editor. He ran the Emporia Gazette in Kansas, and like many journalists at the time, he had a close relationship with Theodore Roosevelt. When reflecting back on TR's life, this is how White described him. I have held through a generation my first flash of Theodore Roosevelt, a tallish yet stockily built man, physically hard and rugged, obviously fighting down the young moon crescent of his vest, quick speaking, forthright, a dynamo of energy, given to gestures and grimaces letting his voice run its full gamut from bass to falsetto. He seemed spiritually to be dancing in the exuberance of a deep, physical joy of life. Until this point in the podcast and this point in the American presidency, we've had presidents who didn't want to be presidents. We've had presidents who said they didn't want to be president, whether they really wanted to or not. We've had presidents who talked about the great burden of leadership responsibility And we've even had presidents who described leaving the White House as just like leaving prison. But now we have a president who is dancing in exuberance. So yes, for this Teddy Roosevelt episode, we will talk a bit about the bully pulpit and the square deal. But mostly, I just want to talk about joy. I want to talk about how someone altered the presidency and the country and the course of 20th century history, basically by being an unstoppable ball of energy. I want to talk about someone unlike anyone we've talked about until now, someone who unabashedly loved being president, someone who thought that being president was just the absolute best, coolest, most fun job on earth. I'm Lillian Cunningham, and this is the 25th episode of Presidential. We shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. What your country can do for you. A date which will live in infamy. My two wonderful guests for this episode are Michelle Kroll from the Library of Congress and the delightful historian David McCullough, who wrote the biography Mornings on Horseback about Theodore Roosevelt. Just as a heads up, I'm going to jump between the two of their interviews in this episode to help tell the story of how TR's exuberant, intensely engaged personality created a new activist style of American presidential leadership. Okay, well, first of all, I mean, I can't believe that we're here at the Teddy Roosevelt (laughs) episode. Finally, you started with Lincoln, guiding me from Lincoln, and now we're all the way at Roosevelt. I I would love your thoughts a little bit on to what extent leading up until this point in the presidency, we've sort of been preparing for TR and how natural an extension it is that a president like him comes along versus should we sort of rightly be caught off guard by how different his style seems to be from the presidents who came before him. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Well, in in some ways we've been preparing for him because TR is the first president who that we will encounter in, in, in this series, at least beginning with Lincoln, who was not an adult during the Civil War. So now with, with TR, who's born in 1858, he saw Lincoln's funeral procession in New York from his grandfather's house. And, you know, there are pictures of him and his brother leaning out the window. And so to some degree with, with the passing of McKinley, we're now also passing the torch to a new generation. And now we're going to see a progressive era where the things of the past are being either reevaluated or changed. Now, of course, the country is wrestling with deep challenges. Industrialization and immigration mean that there's overcrowding in cities and horrible working conditions in factories. In the South, African Americans are actually losing many of their voting rights. And women, 
are still trying to get the right to vote in the first place. Big business, meanwhile, is getting bigger and bigger and consolidating into megatrusts and monopolies. But amid all this, there is a sense that the new tools and technology and voices and ideas of this era can solve all these problems. Here's David McCullough. Roosevelt became president at a time when America was on the uprise in terms of vitality and invention and and uh, progress. And there was every reason to believe in progress. The horrors of the First World War were still over the horizon. So he was he was exactly the vital, confident, optimistic public figure that the Times welcomed. So here we have it. In America that is turning the corner into the 20th century, in America that feels like the worst of its division is behind it, and that the future before it can be bright and strong if only we can stay ahead of that pace of change. Enter Theodore Roosevelt, born in 1858, a young boy who grew up with horrible asthma in a wealthy family in New York City. He was a boy who at first had only a sharp, curious mind trapped in a sickly little body. But then through relentless exercise, he willed that body to conquer its own weakness. So, you know, what would TR be like on a blind date? I asked David McCullough. Like a 110-watt light bulb. He, <laughs> he was full of energy and vitality and bursting with talk and ideas. And here's what Michelle Kroll said. One word came to mind for me about going on a blind date with Theodore Roosevelt, and the word is exhausting. <laughs> In a very good way, though. It takes a particular kind of person to either be married to Teddy Roosevelt or to be his friend or to even be a diplomat in, in his Washington because TR is just a ball of energy. And you know, often people think of the teddy bear because the teddy bear was named after Theodore Roosevelt. And it's cute and it's cuddly. But the, the character that comes to mind for me is that Warner Brothers cartoon, Tasmanian Devil, who's <laughs> just a whirling dervish of activity. And he just plows through everything, sometimes leaving destruction in his wake because he is just energy personified. So if you went on a blind date with him, Heaven knows what you'd be uh, what you'd be in <laughs> for, exactly, because, you know, the young, well, I was going to say the young Theodore Roosevelt, but even the older Theodore Roosevelt, he might take you out rowing, he might take you for a hike, and in their family they have a tradition that when you hit an obstruction, you don't go around it, you don't, you, you just go right over it. So if it's a rock, you go over it. You know, it's this kind of point to point that whatever is in front of you, you're, you're charging through it. He's sort of action man that whatever get, gets into his mind is what he does. It's one of those things that if you are not particularly outdoorsy or you're not up for an adventure, you would not get along with Theodore Roosevelt at all, that you would just absolutely find him too, too much. And many people did find him too much. All right. So we are going to back up now to the woman Teddy fell in love with during college. Because it's important, I think, to understand that his enthusiasm and his energy for life did not actually come from an absence of pain. Theodore Roosevelt kept some diaries uh, when he was younger. And in his 1880 diary is when we get introduced to Alice Hathaway Lee, a girl he fell in love with at Harvard who was from a local family. And he's got this very cute diary entry from um, February 13th, 1880, talking about, about Alice. And she is so marvelously sweet and pure and lovable and pretty that I seem to love her more and more every time I see her, though I love her so much now that I really cannot love her more. I do not think ever a man loved a woman more than I love her. For a year and a quarter now, I have never, even when hunting, gone to sleep or waked up without thinking of her. And I doubt if an hour has passed that I have not thought of her. They remain madly in love with each other, they get married, and almost exactly four years to the day after that diary entry, so now on February 12th, 1884, 
Alice gives birth to a baby girl. At this point, Teddy has finished school and he's entered politics, so he's up in Albany, New York, serving in the state legislature. Alice is back at his family home in New York City. So first, Teddy gets a telegram about the birth, and he's so excited because, well, because of the news that he has a child, and also because his little girl's birthday is the same as Lincoln's, and Teddy Roosevelt just adores Lincoln. But then he starts getting some other telegrams that follow shortly behind the first, and those telegrams start saying that things are actually not going well and he has to come home fast. So he gets back to the house, and you know, his brother Elliot meets him at the door, and he says, you know, there's a curse upon this house, because it turns out that both his mother and his wife are dying at the same time in the same house. And so he... Um, and this is just two days after the birth? Exactly, exactly. So on February 14th, 1884, his mother dies that m- in the morning, and she's only in her 40s, and she dies of typhoid. And then just hours later, his wife Alice dies of Bright's disease, which is a kidney problem. And apparently they weren't aware that she had it. And so on in his diary, let me open it up here. So he has this very little pocket diary. And on February 14th, 1884, there is a black X on it, and the words, the light has gone out of my life probably more for Alice having passed away than his mother, but clearly it was a a double blow for him. And then we turn the page to Saturday, February 16th, and he talks a little, he gives a little history about their relationship, and it says, Alice Hathaway Lee, born at Chestnut Hill, July 29th, 1861. I saw her first on October 1878. I wooed her for over a year before I won her. We were betrothed on January 25th, 1880, and it was announced on February 16th. On October 27th of the same year, we were married. We spent three years of happiness greater and more unalloyed than I have ever known fall to the lot of others. On February 12, 1884, her baby was born, and on February 14th, she died in my arms. My mother had died in the same house on the same day, but a few hours previously. On February 16th, they were buried together in Greenwood. On February 17th, I christened the baby Alice Lee Roosevelt. For joy or for sorrow, my life has now been lived out. And that's the end of the entry. Black care rarely sits behind a rider whose pace is fast enough. Those are the words that Roosevelt used when he described why not long after Alice died, he left their baby with his sister and he went west. He set out for the Badlands in the Dakota Territory and he became a cowboy. And what he meant by those words was Darkness can't catch you if you just keep moving. And so he never stopped moving, ever again. You know that Tasmanian devil Michelle described? Well, T.R. became a rancher and a frontier sheriff in the Badlands. Then he moved back east, published numerous history books. He ran and lost for mayor of New York City. He served on the U.S. Civil Service Commission then as president of the New York City Police Board. Then he became assistant secretary of the Navy under President McKinley. He resigned from that post so he could lead the Rough Riders in the Spanish-American War in Cuba. Then he came back. He became governor of New York and then vice president for McKinley's second term. In all that time, and for the rest of his life, he never wrote or evidently spoke about Alice again. And even his daughter, Alice Lee Roosevelt, he wouldn't call her Alice. She was just Baby Lee, so he didn't have to say Alice's name. Black care rarely sits behind a rider whose pace is fast enough.
What does all of this have to do with Teddy Roosevelt's leadership style? Well, several things, and one of them is just how much he threw himself full force and full speed into whatever was before him. And if there wasn't something before him, he would find something to throw himself into. Roosevelt brings the same energy and enthusiasm to the White House that he does to almost everything else in his life prior to that. He's just sort of taking it by storm. One one thing that where you can see uh, TR's leadership style is when he's appointed the head of the police commission in New York City. And he does a couple of things there that will be very similar to what he does in, in the White House. So for one thing, well, <laughs> for one thing, he runs to the office. So on the first day, the the commissioners are coming down the street and they're walking and he is running. So he's so excited about this job and to get started. And he comes into the into the office and he's, you know, saying hello to everybody and he's running up the stairs and, you know, where's the office? What do we do? What do we start now? And he's just so exuberant about all of this. So one of the one of the things that he does is that he goes on what he calls midnight tours or midnight rambles with Jake. Jacob Reese. Um, he's a police reporter at the time because he knows or he's heard that the police are quite corrupt in New York City, that they haven't been held to account, that they may not be on their beats, that they may be, you know, looking the other way for bribes. And so he and, and Jacob Reese and some of these other people, sometimes they'll, they'll almost put themselves in disguise and they'll go out at midnight and really early in the morning to find out, are the police where they're supposed to be? Uh, and, you know, he'll just announce himself to these po- to policemen, like, why aren't you on your beat? And then he announces he's the police commissioner and they will be a- arriving at his office the next morning. So he understands, and this is where Jacob Reese and some of the reporters can help him because they they investigate. They know what the neighborhoods are like. They know where the problems are. And he wants to know about it firsthand. And same with the sweatshops later on when he's governor. It's one thing to read about it. It's one thing to have someone tell you about it. But for him, it's another thing to actually be on the ground and to go into a tenement and see how people live, to be out on the street and see what the police are actually doing. It's part of his style is that he's he's going to try to understand the issue as much as he can when it's something that he's very interested in. What you also see in, in this example is that he's cultivating the press. And TR is a master at, at publicity and press relations because not only is, is he using Reese and other people who write about it to inform him, but he's working with those reporters because then those stories are going to get out. So, of course, the day after he and Jacob Reese take their first midnight ramble, it's, it's front page news because here's that Theodore Roosevelt going out and, you know, busting these policemen who are not on their beats. So he's, he makes great copy. I mean, he's, he's an adventure. He's colorful. People love to read about him. So he really is cultivating the press in that way. He's learning from them. And it's a, it's a fairly mutual benefit that he gets publicity and understanding, and the, and the reporters have access to someone who's powerful, and they're also getting copy from him. When McKinley was assassinated in 1901, Teddy Roosevelt went from vice president to president. And as one American politics professor described it, Teddy introduced charisma into the presidential equation. He made the presidency itself, not Congress, not the party bosses, but the presidency, the center of American politics. And he did that through force of personality and also through his mastery of using the press to drum up direct public support and enthusiasm, both for him and for his agenda. To this day, T.R. remains the youngest president we've had in our history. He was sworn in at age 42, though many at the time said he acted even younger. One of the the foreign ambassadors told somebody, you must always remember that the president is six years old, that that T.R. is very much a, a kid at heart. So another thing I think we should mention here is that Teddy not only had the spirit of a child, 
but he was surrounded by children. When he returned from the Badlands, he reconnected with his childhood friend, Edith, and they eventually got married and had five kids of their own. Plus, of course, there was little Alice, baby Lee. The White House basically became a jungle gym. T.R. said that his father was the best man he'd ever known, and he replicates that in, in a large degree with his own children. Oh, gosh, he just loved these kids and, and was always playing with them, and, he, and you know, they'd have pillow fights and go on these rambles, and, and he, they seemed to have said yes to every animal <laughs> that, they, that they asked about. Even just going through some of the, the papers of three of the Roosevelt children, I think I counted something like 14 species of <laughs> <laughs> of, of, um, of animal in, in pretty much just their White House years. And, and to some degree, when, when TR was out on the road, people would give him things. So he took a, this tour out in the West, and somebody gave him a badger. And <laughs> so they had Josiah the badger, and they, got a, they had a bear named Jonathan Edwards. And they had flying squirrels and, you know, goldfish and guinea pigs and the normal things like that. But he picked up a, a, horn, a horned toad in the Grand Canyon. They had a parrot named Loretta. They had snakes. They had turtles. I mean, so it's six children plus this menagerie of animals. And you can just imagine sort of the chaos at the White House. TR's youngest son, Quentin, was the chief mischief maker. And he was just absolutely adored by Teddy. Oh, there are so many great stories about how Quentin made spitballs and put them on all the portraits in the White House. And then there's this one story where Roosevelt is meeting in the Oval Office with the Attorney General, very important meeting, and Quentin just bursts in on roller skates with three snakes in his arms, and Teddy's like, oh my gosh, that's so cool, Um, but this is like kind of a serious meeting, Quentin, so why don't you just first go show those to the congressmen who are waiting for me one room over? And so Quentin just like zooms out of the room on his roller skates with the snakes and the congressmen are just like horrified. So, (laughs) you know, not what you expect to to be going on at the White House is, you know, this little boy on roller skates dropping snakes in everybody's laps and, you know, congressmen having to help help off to try to find this errant king snake. As Quentin gets a little older and, you know, he's the, the youngest of the kids. So T.R. writes in some of his letters about how he's just, he's so sad when Quentin no longer wants to play with him. All the kids start growing up, but Teddy still wants the pillow fights and the adventures. Theodore Roosevelt definitely brings a, a virility in a masculine way to the office. He'll do this with visitors to the White House, too. And I'm surprised these people didn't get hazard pay for being an ambassador or a minister during uh, Theodore Roosevelt's administration, because you know they might show up thinking that they're they're going to you know have an, a nice social in the afternoon, and he takes them off to Rock Creek Park, and they're you know running you know having to climb rocks and doing all of these things, and you know if you get to a body of water, well you're taking your clothes off and you're going across the body of water. So there is a very sort of masculine aspect of of his leadership style of his presidential administration. There is a lot about a, a physicality to it. The confidence and the gusto that he displays one-on-one with his children and cabinet officials and ministers, that's all replicated on a broader scale with his leadership approach to running the country. He just hits obstacles head-on. And his philosophy is just, it's so well captured in this quote that has become one of the most famous Teddy Roosevelt quotes. But Frankly, I think for good reason. So here goes. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, 
at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. So I think most people know and associate the term the bully pulpit with Teddy Roosevelt, but could be useful to have you just um, give a little bit of a more nuanced description about what that what that really meant and how he used the bully pulpit as president and how that marks a difference from what we've been seeing up until this point mm-hmm. with presidents. Well, the bully pulpit, and for one thing you have to understand is when Theodore Roosevelt says bully, he's not meaning it in the mean, the mean kind of mm-hmm. kind of way that we associate with bully today. Bully for him means you know fantastic or wonderful. So everything's for him, or it's a bully good time, or he's delighted at something. So the bully pulpit essentially means the presidency is a wonderful pulpit from which I can give you my message, and that's how we used. The, the presidency, talking about what was what was problematic with trusts, for example. There was such a, um, almost a monopoly in, in so many industries that one of the things that he wanted to, to um, achieve was to break up some of the monopolistic trusts that he thought were bad for the economy. Or Um, you know, for conservation, Conservation. for example. Yeah, I mean, when you think of Theodore Roosevelt, you think of of nature. People have the picture in their mind of Theodore Roosevelt standing next to John Muir at at Yosemite in California, that he did care a a lot about the natural world. So he's adding more national parks. He's taking land out of the public domain. Uh, He's really paying attention to uh, conservation principles. I don't know if you want to... um, Um, talk about with his leadership just quickly the whole idea of the square deal yeah you know we should what's the square deal Michelle (laughs) well (laughs) what does it tell us about his presidential leadership style (laughs) well one thing about Theodore Roosevelt's leadership that does bring us more into the modern era is he had he had what he called a square deal and essentially Roosevelt wanted to be fair to everybody regardless of what your socioeconomic level was, what your race was, what your social class, everybody, he wanted to give everybody a fair shake in life um, and, and would do that. But also, if you tried to get something more than what you seem to have been deserving, he would put a, a, a stop to that, too. So um, he, he says, I'm trying to secure the treatment of each man on his merits and not from the standpoint of his class, whether this class be based on occupation, financial standing, creed, or color. I want to help the corporation or the labor union which does well. I want to cinch it when it does ill. I wish to stand by the capitalist when he is decent and by the wage worker when he is decent and against either when he is not decent. And as a great means to this end, I want to have it understood that the law is obeyed by everyone. Now, on some ways, that's a little rich coming from Roosevelt because he would always go right up to the edge of the law. T.R. pretty much had a philosophy that everything was within his authority to do as president, unless it was explicitly prohibited by law. And since the country never had a president before who sought to exercise so much executive power, there really was not a lot that had been clearly established as out of bounds. As Michelle laid out, Roosevelt entered the arena full force domestically. He went after big monopolies, that was his famous trust busting. He succeeded in regulating the railroads. He also pushed through a number of consumer protection laws, like the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906, which would eventually help lead to the creation of the Food and Drug Administration. He also created the Department of Commerce and Labor. And those are two departments today, but they were initially combined under one department, which speaks to Roosevelt's perspective, his square deal philosophy, that the interests of big business and the interests of workers should be able to coexist. Here's one clip of a speech Roosevelt gave on social and industrial justice. In the last 20 years, an increasing percentage of our people have come to depend on industry for their livelihood. So that today the wage workers in industry rank in importance side by side with the pillars of the soil. 
As a people, we cannot afford to let any group of citizens or any individual citizen live or labor under conditions which are injurious to the common welfare. Industry, therefore, must submit to such public regulation as will make it a means of life and health, not of death or inefficiency. It wasn't until Teddy Roosevelt that a president really stood up and decided to define government's role as policing and regulating the private sector. And an interesting fact about the Square Deal, actually, which also highlights TR's communication prowess, was that this was actually the first time a president created a name for his domestic policy agenda. And it would set a trend among 20th century presidents. Woodrow Wilson had his new freedom, FDR had the New Deal, Truman had the Fair Deal, JFK had the New Frontier. Roosevelt's front seat meddling leadership style extended to the global stage. Because of the Spanish-American War under McKinley, America now had its first overseas empire. It had the Philippines, Guam, Puerto Rico, And TR had a vision for America as a world power, particularly as the grand policer of the Western Hemisphere. If you listened all the way back in this podcast to one of our earliest episodes, you may remember when we talked about the Monroe Doctrine, which was basically just the statement that James Monroe made that the U.S. wouldn't tolerate European intervention in the Americas. Well, Teddy takes that, and he develops the TR corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, where he basically twists it to say that America has an obligation to intervene in Latin American affairs. So one particularly controversial example of this is the building of the Panama Canal. Roosevelt just took over that whole project, and he was bound and determined he was going to make it happen, he was going to succeed, and he did it. And that was the kind of vitality and energy and leadership uh, enthusiasm that he was born with. But Colombia had that territory at the time and didn't agree to Roosevelt's terms. So TR basically encouraged a Panamanian revolution so that he could get around having to negotiate with Colombia. Uh, not, he didn't do everything the best way always. He, he really bungled uh, our dealings with uh, Colombia and consequently the creation of the country of Panama. Um, he was not very diplomatic. And he was always in a hurry. And uh, sometimes that wasn't the wisest move. But he was, he, he was passionate and persuasive. In some ways, this set the stage for a certain strain of criticism that America would see around the world at different points over the 20th century. It's a criticism that says America can act sometimes like a country that's high on its own power, that treads on others out of its own self-interest, but at the same time seems above the law itself. That in fact, echoed a personal criticism that T.R. would receive over the course of his life. People saw in him a desire to be at the center of things that could at turns lead him to bulldoze over others. He, he, he could not be anything but the center of attention. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> There's a story that a big, famous big game hunter from, from uh, Africa, an Englishman, was in town, and Roosevelt who loved hunting and going after big animals and so forth, heard that he was in town and said he must come over and see me. This is when Roosevelt was in the the White House, in the Oval Office. And so the man arrived and was taken into the president's office. The door was closed, and people outside could hear the talk going on in there and never stopped. And after about an hour, the man came back out the door looking utterly exhausted and He was asked, what did you tell the president? He said, I told him my name. (laughs) (laughs) TR intervened in Venezuela, in Santo Domingo. He built the U.S. Navy into one of the largest in the world, and he then sent the Great White Fleet out on a global tour to show off America's military might. 
He was also the first American president to win a Nobel Peace Prize, and that was for helping to negotiate an end to the Russo-Japanese War. For good or for ill, depending on how you see it, TR packed more into his seven years in office than multiple presidents have combined. History is about ideas, and the big ideas are what change history or improve history. And optimism, this sense that we can do it. When TR leaves the presidency after two terms, he leaves reluctantly. Then, of course, he promptly sets off on a year-long safari through Africa to fight off those blues. He said he had the best time as president. TR is writing to his son, his son Ted, in 1908, and he says, every now and then solemn jacks come to me to tell me that our country must face the problem of what it will do with its ex-presidents. And I always answer them that there will be one ex-president about whom they need not give themselves the slightest concern, for he will do for himself without any outside assistance. And I add they need waste no sympathy on me that I have had the best time of any man of my age in all the world, that I have enjoyed myself in the White House more than I have ever known any other president to enjoy himself, and that I'm going to enjoy myself thoroughly when I leave the White House, and what is more, continue just as long as I possibly can to do some kind of work that will count. And of course, it doesn't take long after leaving the presidency and returning from Africa, seeing his successor William Howard Taft in office, before TR decides that he just wants to be back in the White House himself. So he ends up running again for president in 1912. We'll talk about that race more next week in Taft's episode. But the spoiler alert is that TR ends up starting a third party, a progressive party. And before one campaign speech he gives in that election, he ends up shot by a would-be assassin. But the bullet is slowed by a 50-page speech that T.R. has in his chest pocket. So he's bleeding through his shirt, and people are trying to get him to go to the hospital, but he refuses to go until he stands up and delivers the entire speech. T.R. does not win a third term. So in that same spirit as always, he just lights off again for another adventure. This time, it's a year-long scientific expedition in one of the most unexplored and dangerous parts of the Amazon, the River of Doubt. Now, the only thing that, that does change him a bit at the end, and it is, it is sort of a sad story, is one of his sons dies in World War I, the youngest son, Quentin, the Quentin, the of, the the, the Quentin of the snakes and the roller skates and the spitballs on the, on the paintings and, you know, the one that, that – the baby of the family. He was an aviator in World War I, and he was shot down by the Germans. And they have a tradition in the Roosevelt family that wherever the lion falls, that's where he's buried. So Quentin was buried in, in France where he fell. But, you know, here's the youngest of the family – and, and he died in the war. And the war had been something that TR had really promoted. Even having gone through a war himself, it was a, you know, a fairly short war. And even having seen other people injured, he, he does have this sort of um, warlike a- attitude about a lot of things, which some people think is, is one of the more ugly or belligerent sides of his personality. And so when World War I breaks out, because of the kind of person that TR is, his 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 boys particularly feel that they have to live up to him. And and I think, and again, this is kind of just my psychological take on it, that, you know, that was, that ended up being one of the ramifications for him of having this sort of warlike attitude of the, you know, go all in, that it ended up leading to the death of one of his sons in addition to the wounding of the others. Quentin was just 20 years old. He died on July 14th. 1918, Bastille Day. As David McCullough told me, Quentin's death shook his father's spirit. T.R. died six months later at only 60 years old in his sleep. In many ways, the optimism of America, like the optimism of T.R., would go from burning so brightly to flickering. 
the innovation and the forward charge, the belief that everything was on the uprise, that all gave way to a world where global wars happen and tragedy takes place on an unimaginable scale. There was something kind of beautiful, though, about the young, energetic spirit of that age. Teddy Roosevelt entered the arena, and it changed the American presidency and the country forever. Do you remember that journalist, William Allen White, whose words about Roosevelt I read at the very beginning of the episode? Well, here's how he described Teddy shortly before his death. There was no twilight and evening star for him. He plunged headlong, snorting, into the breakers of the tide that swept him to another born, full-armed, breasting the waves, a strong swimmer, undaunted. Many thanks to this week's guests, Michelle Kroll and David McCullough. Original music for the podcast is by Dave Wessner. And next week, we will be talking William Howard Taft and a bit more about Teddy Roosevelt with Doris Kearns Goodwin. <laughs> <laughs>